we're talking hundreds of thousands of people who, who have died. These are extra deaths that have just suddenly popped up, and, you know, and we're supposed to go, uh, you know, go for a run or, uh, you know, donate money to this or that and, and you know, find a cure when, when what we really should be looking at is the cause. You're listening to The Corbett Report. Welcome, friends. James Corbett here, CorbettReport.com, June, th- sorry, July 3rd, 2016. And yes, it is the summer, so if you notice the sweat dripping down my face during this conversation, if you happen to be watching the video version, don't worry, I'm not having a heart attack. All right, so that out of the way, today we're going to be talking about a topic that is extremely interesting and extremely controversial, and uh, it goes by many names, and people may have heard of highfalutin talk about geoengineering of stratospheric aerosol injections for solar radiation management and other such techno babble and gobbledygook, or they may have heard the much more common phrase chemtrails. Either way, that's the subject of today's conversation. We're going to be uh, bringing on a guest that we've had on a couple of times in Corbett Report uh, history, so you can search the archives for it. Of course, the links uh, will be in the show notes to our previous conversations with Peter A. Kirby, and he has written a new book called Chemtrails Exposed, a new Manhattan project, which is available for sale at Amazon. He is at PeterAKirby.com. Again, links in the show notes. Peter, thank you for joining us once again on the Corbett Report. Thanks for having me. It's an honor to be here. Well, as I say, this is our third conversation. Um, but for those who haven't caught the first two conversations or need a refresher, perhaps you can just uh, tell us again who you are, where you come from, why you got interested in this subject, and why you wrote the book. Yeah, I'm uh, basically nobody. I, I started by uh, just getting interested in the issue and then uh, going online and posting things on uh, forums and comment sections and wherever I could. And uh, after about uh, oh, and I also I also did uh, an investigation locally uh, into uh, well statewide into the California Air, Re- Air Resources Board. So I was kind of laying the the foundation for this book starting about five or six years ago. Uh, there, I, because right off the top, I knew that there were some things that should be looked into immediately. I mean, you know, there are state agencies, namely the California Air Resources Board. Who should be on top of this situation, but you know that takes months to contact them and have them contact you back and find the right people and all this stuff. But anyway, I was eventually able to cobble together something uh, that uh, that uh, Michael Michael at Activist Post picked up on. Uh, I think he he basically found me posting things in a comment section or, or a forum somewhere, and uh, he went and had and published the thing that I had written in the form. I didn't even know that he had done it at the time. It, it was some months later that I figured out that, uh, that he had published it. And then from there, I began submitting articles directly to Activist Post, and uh, he's been publishing me ever since. And uh, largely what's in the book is uh, a compilation and a condensation of all the articles that I've been posting on Activist Post over the last five or six years. All right, this is obviously to do with the subject of chemtrails or what is being sprayed in the skies overhead that most people have observed at this point, at one point or another, the crisscross patterns in the sky after, uh, you know, a full day of spraying that gradually turn into cloud banks that in often will completely cover the horizon, um, well, horizon to horizon. Um, this phenomenon, obviously, as I say, is controversial because it does sp- stretch the bonds of credulity for for most people when they encounter this idea. And I think there are two ways that people find this incredulous. One is they would find it incredulous that people in government or corporations or military or intelligence agencies or other people who would be situated to do this would do it. And then the other, I think, incredulity that a lot of people has have is that they couldn't they don't think that they could do it. So let's attack those two separate vectors one at a time. And I think the first one, would they do something like this, is something that you lay out extremely well in the first few chapters of this book. You go through so much of the history of this, uh, the development of this idea of weather modification, all of the various proposals that have uh, have been talked about, various ways that they uh, have talked about being able to do it, um, the development of the idea of geoengineering to save us from climate change, etc. Uh, again, there's a lot of d- documentation that you've dug up on this over the years, but just fortuitously, in the last few days, 
I noticed that John Brennan, uh, the director of the CIA, was giving a speech at the Council on Foreign Relations of all places where he himself was talking about geoengineering. So let's just listen to a little bit of that clip. And perhaps we can use this as a way to broach that subject of would they really do something like this? Another example is the array of technologies, often referred to collectively as geoengineering, that potentially could help reverse the warming effects of global climate change. One that has gained my personal attention is stratospheric aerosol injection, or SAI, a method of seeding the stratosphere with particles that can help reflect the sun's heat in much the same way that volcanic eruptions do. On the geopolitical side, the technology's potential to alter weather patterns and benefit certain regions of the world at the expense of other regions could trigger sharp opposition by some nations. Oh, I, I'm sorry, is that well-known conspiracy theorist John Brennan talking about altering weather patterns and spraying things in the atmosphere in order to save us uh, from, from ourselves, apparently? Uh, yes, that's the director of the CIA. And of course, that is just, again, just the latest, just in the last few days, uh, piece of evidence in on this trail. Perhaps you can set out some of the other um, pieces of evidence along that trail. Would they do something like this? Yeah, well, there, there's, I think, the most significant pieces of evidence as far as would they do something like this are two books. One was uh, written by Dr. Leonard A. Cole called Clouds of Secrecy, and the other one was written by someone named Andrew Golachek, and that's called In the Name of Science. And these two books outline hundreds of open-air testing experiments done covertly against the American people over the last 70 years. So, I mean, there, there's other, you know, evidence of, of us being sprayed openly and, and covertly. And, uh, you know, as far as would they do it, I mean, the, the evidence shows that, yeah, they would and they have and they are. Um, as far as the CIA goes, uh, they appear to be deeply involved in, in the new Manhattan Project. Uh, most uh, notably, uh, early on, there are some early documents uh, in 1965. The uh, the office of uh, the executive uh, branch of the of the federal government under LBJ released a document called "Restoring the Quality of Our Environment," and uh, this document uh, was the earliest top level document that I have been able to find that states both the theory of man-made global warming and what John Brennan was just talking about, the uh, SRM, uh, solar uh, radiation management spraying of uh, particles, uh, otherwise commonly known as geo geoengineering. So we're talking a document that came out in 1965. Earlier in that year, although he was not the uh, head of the CIA at the time that it came out in 1965, earlier in 1965, the head of the CIA was none other than Vice Admiral William Raborn, who uh, ha is, is clearly uh, ha has uh, involvement in the development of, of technologies that have gone into this new Manhattan Project. He looks like one of the, the main players historically, and uh, he served briefly as the head of the CIA, uh, and he quit uh, before that paper came out in 1965, but earlier in that year he was the head of the CIA. And uh, I, would, I, I probably can't find it right now. But I think it was in 1971, this is in the Information War chapter, the CIA also released a document, and I forget the name of it, the, the, the book is absolutely jam-packed with, with little factoids and, and information like this, so it's, it's hard for me to, to, to bring up the exact title of a lot of these things. I do know a lot of them by heart, but uh, this is not one of them. But uh, I think it was in 1971, the CIA released a document which appears to be the fount of this idea that global warming can cause the end of humanity. You know, we, we hear this type of stuff in, uh, in the media and, and people repeat it about how, well, you know, the temperature is going to go up and then that's going to cause nations to, you know, run out of food and then there are going to be riots and then there's going to be war and, you know, they're going to have to invade other countries and then this is all going to lead to nuclear war and all this stuff. This was all outlined in a, or it looks to me originally, in a CIA document that I think came out. It was either 1971 or 1974, and uh, ever since then, uh, you know, this has been used as, as a justification for 
uh, for spraying us because they're, they're, they're saying, you know, hey, we don't want global warming to happen. You know, the CIA repeatedly issued lots of reports saying, you know, global warming would be terrible and, you know, we don't want global warming to happen. So, you know, if we spray stuff out of planes, you're going to be great. And this idea of spraying stuff out of planes, the, the earliest mention, first of all, the, the earliest mention of the theory of man-made global warming that I've been able to find is in 1958. That was a big year. Lots of, lots of uh, th this type of uh, information was coming out then. In 1958, uh, weather modifier Her Howard T. Orville released uh, an article in Popular Science. I'm, I'm looking at it right now instead of looking at the camera. Uh, titled "Weather as a Weapon," and, and this is the earliest mention of. Uh, of uh, the theory of man-made global warming that I've been able to find. So the, the, the earliest mention of the theory of man-made global warming appears in a, an article about weather modification from, at the time, the, the leading weather, weather modifier, uh, Howard T. Orville, who served as a science advisor to the president. Also in, in that same year, the uh, solar radiation management geoengineering thesis was unveiled in the most cited report, uh, weather, weather modification report, this uh, was a, a report titled uh, uh, The Final Report of the Advisory Committee on Weather Control. None other than Bernard Vonnegut, who has been deeply involved in, uh, in the development of technologies that have gone into the New Manhattan Project, was a co-author of this paper. And the paper reads, the radiation properties of the atmosphere can be altered by the introduction of gases or aerosols and by cloud seeding. So, you know, the, the whole idea of the theory of man-made global warming comes from weather modification. It, it, all the, the, the earliest documents are related to weather modification. Over the years, it was, uh, I think, in the, in the late 60s and on into the 70s, they started changing the rhetoric from weather to climate. And, and this is when uh, the, uh, what do they call it, the uh, atmospheric chemistry idea came in. And, and the atmospheric chemists, when they, when they started get, getting more complex with the uh, things they could sense in, in, in the atmosphere, it, it concurrently they were changing the rhetoric from, from weather to climate. So, uh, you know, we see the CIA deeply involved and, and we also see the very strong, incredibly strong connections between weather modification and the theory of man-made global warming. I think we should uh, back up for a moment. First of all, I'll direct people to our previous conversation where we talked at length about Bernard Vonnegut and uh, the other people at GE Labs who were foundational in, in a lot of the technologies for this uh, this modern era of scientific weather manipulation. But Let's just back up for a moment. The subtitle and a, a phrase that you've used a number of times here, New Manhattan Pro Project. I understand this isn't a, a, a term that you coined. It is available. It has been used before. But why is that term important for understanding this project? Well, it came out, this, this project of weather modification largely came out of the original Manhattan Project. Uh, first of all, it is a, a physics problem. And uh, the people who put together the first uh, atomic bombs were physicists. And just uh, recently, the, the most recent book I've read, uh, which is not in the, this, uh, this first edition of, of the book, but I, I'm really seeing that the same people, uh, the, it, it, there's a certain group of, of scientists who were... Uh, in, in the, the most, they were the most uh, prominent scientists of their time, and, and they developed the uh, original Manhattan Project. They developed the uh, first atomic bombs, and, and on, on into uh, the radiation laboratory at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, uh, they uh, developed also a lot of uh, technology that, that went into uh, th this new Manhattan Project. Uh, specifically, as you might assume from the title of the uh, of the MIT laboratory, the uh, electromagnetic aspects of, of the New Manhattan Project, uh, not only uh, the uh, radar that is uh, used for 
uh, over the over the horizon radar was something that they developed, which uh, is is uh, electromagnetic energy, which is bounced off of the ionosphere and is able to remotely sense objects uh, thousands of miles away. That was developed at the radiation uh, laboratory of MIT, and uh, it looks like they were also at MIT deeply involved in the electromagnetic uh, uh, energy uh, development of, uh, excuse me, uh, things that went into the aircraft control systems that are used today in uh, the new Manhattan Project. They, they, it looks like they developed the ability to remotely control airplanes at this at this laboratory. So uh, it, it it's there's a, a a group of physicists that uh, initial initiate that appear to have initiated the new Manhattan Project, and that's the connection. So what is it that we're talking about here? Because when people hear about weather modification, they might think, well, of course, we've had cloud seeding for over half a century now, commercially available. You spray silver iodide, it nucleates and creates rainfall in a given area. We've known about that for a long time. Nothing new here. What is new about the new Manhattan Project aspect of this? Well, uh, the, dif- the differences between the original cloud seeding uh, industry, which goes on to this day, and the new Manhattan Project uh, is mostly the fact that, the, that electromagnetic energy is used to disperse the particles that come out of the airplane and, uh, and, and also uh, conventional, conventional weather modification is done on a regional basis and uh, the new Manhattan Project is done on a global basis. And uh, yeah, the, the new Manhattan Project is covert, and the uh, the uh, conventional cloud seeding industry has been overt since 1947. This, and uh, it was the same group, uh, the same three scientists from uh, General Electric Laboratories in 1946 that simultaneously launched both of those. So I guess that's another kind of cover for the new Manhattan Project. It's like, oh yeah, we know those scientists. You know, they, they launched the conventional cloud seeding industry. Yeah, but at the same time, Bernard Vonnegut went on to uh, work with the electrical manipulation of atmospheric particles. And I would assume, although I have not been able to make the connection, the electromagnetic manipulation of atmospheric particles. I, I hope to make that connection between uh, Vonnegut and uh, those activities in the future. So what's being suggested here is that there are planes that are spraying whatever chemical cocktail overhead, and there is also ionospheric heaters and other advanced technologies for manipulating those particles once they are released to the end of weather modification? Yes, and and very advanced command and control centers as well. In what sense command and control centers? Well, you you would need uh, to know, you would have to have centralized control of, of these operations. You would uh, need uh, to know where all the planes are at any given time, you know, uh, and be able to direct them to where you need the particles dispersed. You would need to be able to have the supercomputers modeling all the atmospheric models and, you know, keeping track of all the temperature and saturation and humidity and everything uh, in real time. You would need uh, the uh, control of, of the ionospheric heaters and the electromagnetic energy portion portions of it. You you would need a, a central command where uh, people can can oversee the, the whole project and be able to direct it. That of course leads us into the other aspect of the incredulity. Could they do this? Uh, we're talking here just from what you're saying at least hundreds, perhaps thousands of aircraft that would be needed for this and the, these command and control centers, all of this monitoring, all of the technologies that would go into to, to this and all of the people involved in all of those technologies. It's a mind boggling thing. And I understand why a lot of people would say it's just not possible for that to happen. What evidence have you uncovered to suggest that this is happening? Well, as far as the command and control centers are concerned, those would be relatively easy to hide. You know, we have uh, many uh, very highly secure facilities all over the country, you know, with uh, highly classified uh, activities going on. Uh, We have Florence Livermore National Labs, which is is someplace that I talk about in the book. Uh, I've been just recently thinking about uh, NASA 
Ames Research Center down there on the peninsula. I think they're in Sunnyvale. Uh, they uh, have, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's a very well-known common thing. That there are certain areas that you don't go to and you have to have security clearance and all this stuff. I mean, they, they could be doing anything in there. We don't know. There's all these black budgets. You know, our, our tax money just goes into a black hole and they don't have to report on anything. You know, they could, be, they could have been using black budgets over the decades to, to fund all this stuff. Um, and then uh, as far as the airplanes go, which would probably be the, the most difficult thing to hide, I got my eye on, this is not in the book, uh, I like to speculate more in the interview, I like to go with more stuff I can prove in the book, but I, I find it uh, fun to do this. There's a certain Air Force base in Alaska that I have my eye on. As far as I know, there's only two Air Force bases in Alaska. One is uh, Elmendorf which is, uh, I'm not sure where they are, but uh, the other one that I have my eye on, Elmendorf is the one that everyone knows of. It's huge and uh, very well known. But there's another one called Clear Air Force Base, which is in the interior, I believe, near Fairbanks. And you can, you can look it up on, on Google Maps. And uh, it's, it's relatively close to the Hart facility. And uh, my research... Uh, indicates that uh, the chemtrail spraying planes have probably followed the ionospheric heaters wherever they go because uh, to, for, for firstly to conduct experiments it would be advantageous to uh, have the airplanes taking off and landing and spraying in the vicinity of the ionospheric heater you know within you know, let's say uh, 500 miles or something like that and uh, and uh, the uh, they, they may have uh, a, a lot of uh, hidden things there. Uh, I, I don't know. You know, it's hard to tell from, from Google Maps. I, and like I said, I don't, I don't have a lot of, lot of evidence for this. But, um, the, you know, they, they could have some facilities there that are highly automated and, and highly secret. They could be blotting things out on, on Google Maps. And, you know, maybe they have some type of thing that allows airplanes to, you know, drive into something underground maybe underground facilities. I mean, uh, the, the fact that, that uh, we have underground facilities in this country and our military has been very hard at work at, at digging underground bases is, is well documented. And uh, I believe it's within the, the technical capabilities of, uh, of our, our, our current military to build such a, uh, such a, a complex, such a, such a facility. And uh, that would be my suggestion, because I, I, I think it would be advantageous to have a, a certain uh, home base for the aircraft where uh, you know they could be worked upon and, and uh, replenished and, and things like this and and not only that uh, there's there's some evidence to this that it, it might be in Alaska as well in William Thomas's book chemtrails confirmed he interviews uh, somebody who is uh, very familiar with uh, air traffic in the British Columbia area and uh, this guy says that he, he sees the planes coming down from Alaska and, and spraying and then returning to Alaska later in the day. So, uh, you know, and, and also Alaska is very, very strategically oriented on the globe. If you take a globe, I have a globe over there. If you take a globe and, and look at where Alaska is, it's almost equidistant from the contiguous 48 states. Uh, to and, and then to uh, the most industrialized areas of Asia, you, you know you've been seeing chemtrails over there in Japan, and uh, and then to Europe, it's very strategically located, and and so the planes uh, could be originating from uh, Alaska and being hidden up there. You know that that would be a great place to hide them. I mean, you know who wants to go to the middle of Alaska, right? No offense to our Alaskan listeners, but uh, yeah, no, and I, I, I was just going to say, yes, that lines up with what William Thomas was reporting on two decades ago, almost when he started really reporting on all of this. So uh, that does make sense, but I appreciate the informed speculation that you, uh, that you bring to the table because uh, throughout the book, uh, I think you make it clear that there, is, there are certain things that you are documenting. Here is the document, here is the facts, here are the people involved, and then there are other things that you are speculating on. And I noted a few of them as I was reading through the book. The proprietary, pro, the proprietary aircraft of this new Manhattan project may be powered wirelessly and have no need for conventional jet fuel. 
evidence and logic suggest that these aircraft in the New Manhattan Project are operated remotely as drones. Have Hertzian antennas been strategically uh, placed around the country and the world in a coordinated effort to mof- modify the weather? Question mark. Ionosphere ferricators such as HARP may be, may be used in conjunction with chemtrails to modify the weather. Chemtrails are probably sprayed to enhance the effectiveness of these operations. I've got a, a number of these that I've highlighted, and I think this speaks to the problem that is inherent to this research, which obviously... Um, there is interest in geoengineering. There are various programs that are at work on this. There are whatever layers of secrecy and con- con- classified material that are going on under the surface that we do not have access to. We do have little bits and pieces from the public record and things that we can connect behind the scenes. But how do we juggle that problem of what is documentable and verifiable to what is informed speculation? Yeah, the, the information as pertaining to this this project is just scattered to the four corners of the of the world and I, you know I'm going around gathering up a little piece over here a little piece over there and trying to put it all back together trying to re-engineer this thing but you know I I, I speak about the information in the, the the frankest manner that I possibly can you know I'm, I'm trying to stay true to, to my readers uh, I don't want to mislead my readers and also I don't want to get sued you know, I don't want to. This, this is why you hear me prefacing things like they have developed technology, that w- which probably is used in today's New Manhattan Project and things. You know, uh, because uh, I, I'm also saying that that this is a, a mass murder operation, and you know, if I just go saying like, oh yeah, you know, DARPA's behind it. Oh yeah, MIT's behind it. Oh yeah, it's, it's the military, and you know, it's these people, and they're doing it. I mean, they they could sue me for slander because, and they, and they might be able to get away with it too because they can just say, well, well that you know, you you can't, it, you these things are not going to come out in court because they're classified. You know, so I'm trying to uh, I'm trying to stay out of court, and I'm trying to be true to the information. It is a difficult line to walk, but as I say, you do provide so many different pieces of evidence that do add up in in these uh, various ways, some of which can be surprising even to people like myself who've looked at this subject in the past. For example, one thing that I noticed um, was that despite all of this talk about geoengineering that has become more and more common in congressional committees and these types of hearings are being held on a regular basis, we have major prominent scientists speaking out about this, David Keith and others are going around pimping this idea everywhere they go. And yet there is remarkably little research or even apparently interest in the the medical or health effects or at least potential effects of stratospheric aerosol injection. And you uh, pointed um, you, uh, to a, a, a journal article that I hadn't seen from earlier this year, assessing the direct occupational and public health impacts of solar radiation management with stratospheric aerosols by uh, Dr. F. Young and Netzel, um, which uh, I'll put the link in the show notes for people who are interested. But it's interesting the way that they are talking about it in the abstract for this paper. Um, they're saying, uh, although much is being done to unravel the scientific and technical challenges around ge- geoengineering, there have been few efforts to characterize the potential human health impacts of geoengineering, particularly with regards to SRM, solar radiation management approaches involving stratospheric aerosols. And this paper explores the information gap. So using available evidence, we describe the potential direct oc- occupational and public health impacts of exposures to aerosols likely to be used for SRM. There are so um, They're couching it in so many variables here because, of course, this is is all theoretical and we don't know anything about it, but if you were to spray aluminum oxide aerosols or barium uh, titanate or any of these other uh, chemicals on people, it might be a really bad thing as they end up concluding, um, although we don't know because no one's researching it. Can you speak to the that, not just the health aspects of it, but the remarkable lack of interest in the potential health aspects of a uh, new Manhattan project? Yeah, that that paper you're referencing was a a very significant development. It came out right before I released the uh, biological impact, or it might have come out after, I forgot. Anyway, but uh, yeah, that was the first uh, really reputable, or at first actually of any study that I had ever seen uh, pertaining to, you know, what the biological impacts of these materials might be. Uh, you know, and it was done by like PhD scientists from a reputable organization and all this stuff. But uh, yeah, well, I 
I would speculate, though, that actually the health impacts and the biological impacts have, have been studied extensively, but these studies have just not been made public. Uh, that's, that would be uh, what, what I assume has taken place, you know, it, because it, it, the, the health, the biological impacts are what we've seen are grave. You know, this, this is mass murder. You know, and, and I, I make a case for that as far as Alzheimer's goes. We're talking hundreds of thousands of people who, who have died. These are extra deaths that have just suddenly popped up. And, you know, and we're supposed to go, uh, you know, go for a run or, uh, you know, donate money to this or that and, and you know, find a cure when, when what we really should be looking at is the cause. And uh, so it's just, it's just layer upon layer of cover up. And uh, it's great that they that somebody is actually looking at this stuff, and and not only not only uh, is there a history uh, or is there evidence for the materials they're using being harmful to our health as part as part of the New Manhattan Project. Also, if you look at the history of the conventional cloud seeding industry, there there's been a tremendous lack of research in, into just our exposure to silver iodide, which is what they use in the conventional cloud seeding industry. Of course, you know, the, their industry association says, oh, don't worry about it, you know, and then they cite all the, uh, all the information that, that says that, you know, it's not going to, not a problem and all this. But the bottom line is there has never been any long-term studies done as far, any public long-term studies done as far as the uh, biological impacts of uh, silver iodide is concerned. So, I mean, you know, they've set a precedent as far as weather modification goes that they don't have to do long-term studies. They don't have to show us what, what's really going on here. And, uh, you know, this, this is being repeated with uh, the new Manhattan Project. That's right. As you point out in the book, the best that you get even with the silver iodide, the, the conventional cloud seeding technologies, are impact studies on whether more or less rain will affect the ecosystem, generally speaking, but not the actual effect of the actual chemicals that are being used, which is, again, it's, it's, it's not surprising, I suppose, from the, the aspect of uh, if people who are putting this plan into place obviously don't want people to concentrate on the potential health effects. But it is amazing that even after all of these parliamentary inquiries, the European Parliament talking about it, or the, uh, the congressional committees on geoengineering, still no one thinks to ask oh, have you done a health impact assessment of this? They're, they're avoiding the most obvious question. Exactly. All right. Uh, obviously, way too much information in this book that we could possibly cover in a conversation like this. And I was particularly interested in some of the uh, the chapters on, on the fleet itself and the composition of it and how the, it's managed and put together and things of that nature. So we will direct people uh, once again to your website, PeterAKirby.com, and also to the book itself, Chemtrails Exposed. So if they are interested, they can pursue this at greater length. You've had a lot of uh, articles published up at Activist Post with various excerpts from the book. So... Again, people can look for some of your work there, and uh, you're going to be making the rounds on uh, all sorts of shows, I'm sure, in the coming weeks and months talking about the book, so people can track your activity, I assume, at PeterAKirby.com? PeterAKirby.com, that's probably the best place to go. I hope, I hope to be doing your show uh, again many more times in the future, James. I really appreciate what you do. All right, excellent. Thank you very much for your time, uh, Peter, and good luck with the book. Thank you very much. The Corbett Report is brought to you by The Corbett Report Subscriber. A weekly newsletter featuring James Corbett's International Forecaster Editorial, recommended reading and viewing, discounts on Corbett Report DVDs, and once a month, a subscriber-only video. Sign up today to start receiving your copy at corbettreport.com support.